sangona ni nonke ni si or i wish to extend my great gratitude to uh, professor boaventura and his team for the privilege of inviting me to share with you here i also would like to beg for your patience in allowing me to exercise our right to epistemic justice by commencing my talk with a summary of it in my own mother tongue. Oto ka tole on yamu tole fati ili sano ili utahore moto utabe kamore moto ke na monteo le monteki wa pidisa moto uteka pidisa kabo uto ubuntu ne boyata undi shoye ke wola eta wola mola wa moto pe ke wona tepo ya moto e upya the high 
highest contemplative requirement indispensable to all fruitful philosophy is merely another way of condemning ourselves to dependency and subjection. In philosophy, as in science, only he who has the key to theory and application conceived and executed Sorry, only he who has the key to theory can appropriate the advances and powers of civilization. Our philosophy should be then both theory and application conceived and executed in our own fashion according to our own standards and qualities. Just as science, which in spite of its declared objectivity, tolerates, particularly in the social disciplines, an ingredient of interpretation and ideology, so too should philosophy be elaborated by us as theory according to our own standards and applied in accord with our own ends. A freedom fighter does not bear in pious genuflection for strategy and tactics from the slave owner. Without our prior choice or wish, we are all the children of mother birth. A foreigner, a stranger, a refugee is a cultural but not a natural phenomenon. Mother Earth is not just a place. She is the home of every human being, wherever we may be or wish to be. Mother Earth is the panario, the breadbasket of every human being. Past generations of human beings have fed on Mother Earth. We are feeding on Mother Earth. And future generations shall feed on her if the mad irrationality of strategic nuclear weapons does not turn Mother Earth into a radioactive rubber. We ought, all of us, human beings, to feed from Mother Earth. We ought to acknowledge that feeding from Mother Earth cannot be successful if it is done as a solitary, isolated, individual effort. Mother Earth teaches in the Akan language for example, that obra ye no qua, translating into life is mutual aid. Accepting this African ethical maxim means ensuring continual feeding by engaging continuously in litzima. Tzima meaning working together collectively to promote and protect the life and well-being of everyone. This includes erecting sishiru or inkolobani yesizwe to stop
store and preserve food in order to give to the needy and to share the food collectively in the event of prolonged drought or other natural disasters. Mother Earth is prior in logic and time to all her children. No child can be older than its mother, except in the case of adoption by law. None of the children of Mother Earth can make a successful claim to exclusive, prior, and superior claim in respect of all her other children. At birth, nobody ever did or does bring along a piece of land to expand the size of Mother Earth or to enhance her quality. Accordingly, the claim to absolute and exclusive ownership of any piece of land on Mother Earth is a grand illusion, except that, in practice, it does have serious and sometimes even deadly consequences. If there be any ownership at all of Mother Earth, then such talk is bound to recognize her as the subject of pluriversal collective ownership by all human communities. It is unethical for wealth or money as it continues to do, to trump the human right of all human beings to the pluriversal collective ownership of Mother Earth. The injustice of the current dominant economic system lies precisely in its denial that Mother Earth is the breadbasket the ontological penarium of all human beings, including all that lives. This fundamental injustice is unsustainable, even on scientific grounds. One of the significant findings of the Human Genome Project is that at the DNA level, we are all 99.9% identical. That similarity applies, so the report continues, regardless of which two individuals from around the world you choose to compare. Thus, by DNA analysis, we humans are truly one family. We are only as individuals. We are one only as individual human beings. But as a genetic family, we are a oneness floating holocyclically through the wholeness of being. The claim that we own our bodies in the sense that the body is mine is philosophically problematical. One part of the problem is that none of us had a prior say or choice in being an animal with a body. Another part of the problem is this. Who is the I that claims ownership of the body? It is not my purpose to delve into this problem. Suffice it to state that the I that claims to 
own the body is, to use a familiar phrase in philosophy, so systematically elusive that it is perhaps best to give up the search for it. If we cannot own our body, by what right may we claim to own any part of Mother Earth that we live in and by? Since we are all existentially condemned to labor in the broadest possible sense in order to survive, it is unnecessary to rest the claim to ownership of land or other necessaries of life on labor. Here the distinction between labor and work or a job is crucial. The former is existentially indispensable for every human being, including babies. The latter rests on the philosophical fallacy translated into the widespread practice that some human beings are owners of wealth and money and by virtue of such ownership are entitled to offer employment to others. The practical effect of this philosophical fallacy is that humanity is affected and infected by the double, apparently incurable diseases which I choose to name pecunimania and jogomania. Money is insane as the decisive medium between life and death of all human beings. Having money is the seeming guarantor of the fulfillment of the right to life, the inalienable right to subsistence. Having no money is the inevitable condemnation to abrupt or slow death, including violent death. <coughs> the shield against this inevitable condemnation is actually having a job that gives money in return. This is the historical, systematic and systemic structure that today separates separating the poor from the rich and renders the former pawns of the latter through the medium of civilized law. Is it really necessary that everyone should be the patient of Pupunimania and Jogomania in order to abide by the existential imperative to labor for the preservation and sustenance of individual and collective life. In the beginning, there was a human being, not wealth, money, or a job. Long before the invention of money and the job, the philosophy of Ubuntu lived by the ethical maxim this means that if and when one ought to make a choice between the preservation of human life and the continual accumulation of wealth, then one ought to choose for the preservation of human life. Ujama and Umunda, the Ubuntu experiences and concepts of oneness of the human family, 
predate the findings of the Human Genome Project. They are the practical implementation of the ethics of life is mutual aid. And making Litsema an ethical imperative manifesting this concern, care and sharing with one another the necessaries of life available in Sichirho or in Moloba Yezizu. This is the meaning of Motubi, the human being first. It is consistent with the basic premise of Ubuntu ethics, namely promote life and avoid killing. Historically and philosophically, the ethics of Motubi is at fundamental odds with the prevailing global economic system. The crucial point of contention is that the former upholds the preferential option for human well-being in practice, whereas the latter concedes this option in theory, but in practice, often does the reverse. Money has a long history, especially in the West. Four elements feature prominently in this history. One is that money and wealth do not have the same meaning, but they are related to each other. The second is that having a lot of money is generally deemed to be the source of prestige and the exercise of social power in a manner that undermines morality. <coughs> The third is that money is ubiquitous, imposing its rule everywhere. It can be the cause of moral decadence, disillusionment, and lawlessness. The fourth is that money has been elevated, especially in our time to the status of a God worthy of adoration and veneration. The bank as an institution within the dominant prevailing global economic system provides an insight into whether or not anyone is wealthy and owns money. Money is deposited in the bank, presumably as one's own, and therefore under one's exclusive control. Yet, the much talked about global economic crises hit some countries very hard. The result was that the clients of the banks were allowed only a prescribed minimum withdrawal per day, regardless of how much they had in their bank accounts. The decision by the bank instantly created formal equality between its poor and rich clients. At the same time, it instilled in both the rich and the poor the fear that they were unlikely to recover the total amount of money they had deposited in the bank. Where then is the money that was deposited? What did the bank do with it to the extent that it cannot give to each depositor the total credit amount it wants to withdraw immediately? 
Why is it that even the wealthy of yesterday suddenly own nothing when there is an economic crisis? Add to this the fact that even in normal circumstances, without any financial crisis, the bank requires advance notice if one wants to withdraw an amount above the unilaterally prescribed limit by the bank. <coughs> by what right does the bank acquire the power, as well as the discretion, to determine how much and when the depositor may withdraw a substantial or total credit amount available in the account? If the money really is owned by the depositor, then the bank's power and discretion over that money does not belong and it is problematic. It would seem that the bank is the guardian of moral numbers fed to the depositor as if the numbers contained any substance. If this were not so, then each depositor with a credit amount available should be allowed to withdraw immediately the total amount at its own pleasure. The determination of the bank to disallow this kind of withdrawal, especially on a massive scale, is the fear <coughs> that the entire economic system shall implode. Testate or intestate disposition is no proof of ownership of wealth or money. On the contrary, it is a desperate valediction to the world, refusing to accept that during our lifetime we have not been more than mere vital dust. The poor and the rich are a mythical social construction sustained by the bank as the guardian of hollow numbers dispensed and distributed with utmost caution. Law is no longer the sovereign command of the people but a deadly precision missile assuring obedience to the grand delusion of ownership of money and wealth. So strong is this delusion that in practice many die for the sake of profit for the few. A short reflection upon the influence of the military-industrial complex upon governments should attest to the veracity of this observation. The reflection will reveal that the maxim in Western antiquity that power and not truth makes the law authoritas, non veritas, fighting legend, is very much alive today. Ubuntu is against this maxim. It affirms that truthfulness is the veritable basis for the conduct of human relations in the quest for justice and peace. Such is the precedence of money over the human being. It is money first and the human being second. It is not motopili abiding by the ethical maxim fita komu otsare mutu. The bank is not in global yesizwe but the defender of an economic system <laughs> unjust at its root. It seems that
that science, especially history, psychology, and philosophy, have the arduous task of redeeming humanity from the grand delusion of, money, of ownership of money and wealth. The philosophy of Ubuntu originates from Mother Africa, the cradle of humanity. It is the philosophy of the Bantu-speaking peoples from time immemorial. Its origin from Mother Africa suggests that it is the first philosophy of Homo sapiens. The exodus of the human being out of Africa to other parts of the world affirms Ubuntu as the philosophy for everyone. No doubt, those with a short memory of biological anthropology continue to inflict suffering on Mother Africa and in that way turn her into a perpetual Mater Dolorosa, a mother of sorrows. On his visit to the island of Gore in Dakar in 1992, Pope John Paul II acknowledged this when he described Gore as the sanctuary of African suffering. These words appear on the plaque inside the church in Gore. Mother Africa ought to be accorded the honor she deserves as the mother of Homo sapiens by preserving her as a precious mother, a mother preciosa. Doing so includes taking the philosophy of Ubuntu seriously, not only as a philosophy for everyone, but also as a philosophy with and by everyone. The philosophy of Ubuntu does not claim infallibility, nor does it claim to be the philosophy of all philosophies. However, it insists upon the right to be heard. It proceeds from the insight that motion is the principle of being continually unfolding as a wholeness. It recognizes ethical humanness as the appropriate response to the ontological equality of all human beings. The ethical human, humanness of Ubuntu is addressed directly to Umundu as an obligation to pursue in practice truth, justice, and peace in the world. In this way, Ubuntu becomes a philopraxis, an active engagement in the unfolding history of the human being as a human being in the world. The philosophy of Ubuntu is not an endeavor to theorize from the borders. The philosophy of Ubuntu is against the epistemic and physical boundaries erected arbitrarily by the colonial conqueror and its allies. Contrary to Descartes' metaphysical cogito ergo sum, complemented by the practical conquero ergo sum, the philosophy of Ubuntu is predicated on cognatus sum ergo sumus. I am related, therefore we are. It is a practical 
ethical philosophy, espousing ethical humanness based on the recognition that all human beings are equal in our ontology. Ubuntu is a philopraxis, recognizing that one of the vital lessons to be drawn from the existing mad nuclear weapon situation is that resort to torture, violence, or war in the resolution of human conflict may not be an option at all. Despite the fragility and vulnerability of reason alone in the quest for truth, justice, and peace. Ubuntu holds that reason, infused and inspired by the primacy, primacy of the ethical dimension in human relations, has a better chance to succeed than resort to torture, violence, or war. The well-considered motto of the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland, namely, plus ratio quam vis, let reason prevail over force, deserves special prominence in our time. Reason, the leveler, may yet turn out to be reason, the liberator, if we take ourselves seriously. Thank you for your attention.